talk about boomers, the first thing you think of is drugs, sex, and rock and roll, which are actually three things, not one thing. And what I'm going to start my panel off, uh, questioning off is, do you guys think it was worth it, given all the things we went through? Were those years worth it? Absolutely. <laughs> can, you, can you tell us why? Go ahead. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Um, yeah, I had a good time, but I had a, a bunch of friends that had such a good time that they're not with us anymore. You know, they kind of, you know, um, and uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was one of those people who was very lucky that I, I, I threw up easy. <laughs> John Belushi didn't throw up so easy, <laughs> so, so we don't have him. Uh, so yeah, they, they, they definitely had, uh, but I liked it. You know. I went to girls' school, so I sort of missed it. I remember you had to like get on a bus and like go to Yale or go to Amherst to go have drug sex and rock and roll. But <laughs> it was worth it when she got there. <laughs> well, it's interesting. When we were uh, starting my generation, we did a lot of research and focus groups, and um, particularly the drugs part, nobody wanted to remember. And a lot of people seem to have rewritten history on that score. And now that they have children, who might be thinking about drugs, it, it's a problem for them how to talk to their kids. And I know, Dominique, you have kids around that age. How do you deal with that? I have a 17-year-old and a 13-year-old, and you have to rewrite history. I'm constantly telling my children, everyone else I knew did drugs, and they should go talk to my sister if they want to hear what it was really like. Because <laughs> <laughs> she still does them. <laughs> and as for sex, my boys don't want to hear a word about sex from their mothers, but I try to take them to movies like American Pie and things like that. They're very educational. <laughs> Uh, we just did a survey, actually, about, and the survey was called, What Turns You On? And the number one thing that boomers said turned them all, two things, was sex and uh, being with their family, and the absolute last thing on the list was work, which seems to have taken kind of a backseat to people's lives. If they put family ahead of golf, they're lying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> golf didn't come into it, but golf having fun was a, having fun was a very big part of it, and many of them actually felt that they had missed out on having fun and wanted to catch up now. Actually, it's a surprisingly small percentage. Ooh, <laughs> going to get control. you. Uh, but would make a great bong. <laughs> 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 it was a surprisingly small percentage of uh, of the people in the '60s who were actually doing the stuff that made the '60s so famous for being the 60s. Uh, that said, I was one of them. Uh, and uh, I have a friend, Andy Ferguson, who's an absolutely fabulous writer, uh, and, uh, and also very, he's a very religious, he's a very moral guy, and I often go to Andy when I've got some conundrum. My kids are little, and, so I, and Andy's are a little older, and I said, Andy, what are you gonna do? Andy was there too, Andy did all this stuff. And I said, Andy, what do you, when the kids start to ask about, you know, what did you, what, you know. What, Where were you in the 60s, yeah, yep. Yeah, what are you gonna do? And Andy said, lie. I'm just going to lie. I'm going to lie right through my teeth. And I said, well, I'm kind of on record. I mean, I wrote a piece <laughs> called uh, How to Drive Fast on Drugs While Getting Your Wing Wang Squeezed and Not Spill Your Drink. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Andy, Andy basically said, get over yourself. He said, you know, th 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 there's one constituency that you can absolutely depend upon that will never have any interest in anything that you ever wrote, and that will be your children. <laughs> You're safe from them. Others may catch up. Well, now, do you think that's a result of you being their dad, or as a result of people really being sick of the boomers talking about themselves and celebrating themselves? No, I mean it's about my being a dad. I don't want kids to take. I don't want kids to take drugs. I don't think. I think they should have sex when they're forty. <laughs> <laughs> they're girls. I've got girls. <laughs> you know. Or, um, I'm, uh, girls and shotguns. I've got shotguns. And, uh, so just, and they go together. Yeah. They go very we're well not, together. We're not having any of that in, in my house. And so I don't want any of that, that two coke sort of arguments. Well, you did it, you know. Right. So I'm going to lie. Speaking of, uh, while we're on the subject of lying, which I guess we sort of are, um, we're kind of, uh, we're, we're living in a very, I would say, ageist society. And I, I certainly find, uh, being the editor of this magazine, that um, people aren't always receptive to people our age, and, and they are very, very nervous about people getting older. I was wondering your views on, on getting older and how you feel as being part of this society. Do you feel that you know, you're treated like an old person? How do you feel about the aging question? Who's aging? <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> you know, it's interesting, TJ and I were talking outside right before we came on, and we both have children who are two years old. And that's a very interesting thing, when you're of another generation than the people who usually have two-year-old children. So in a sense, age begins to, ch the lines begin to change a little bit um, about what, what age is proper to do what. Um, and I think that's very interesting about our generation. Uh, sort of when one has a family and changing those borders. Hmm. Do you find being an older parent, are, do you find you're alone in this or, or is this a very common thing, particularly in New York? I do find I'm exhausted, but, <laughs> but I but do. But not alone. In but that. not alone. <laughs> But I mean, I did sit next to a woman at a luncheon who told me she had a child older. I mean, when she had her child, she was older than me. And I was 130, so I was <laughs> <laughs> taken by this. Um, I think that because we're in New York and people tend to make up their own lives, I think it has, it's less of an oddity, really. It, it does bring us to the, the new book by Sylvianne uh, Hewitt about uh, people, women in our generation who are so on the fast track that they either forgot to have children or, as she puts it, nobody would marry them and that he didn't have children. Um, it's caused quite a controversy and I wonder what, what uh, have, you, have either of you read it, Dominique or Wendy? I've read about it. I'm in it, but, <laughs> but um, I, have, I do have strong feelings about that, Betsy, because I think it is important to know the statistics, but I don't think you can tell young women to live an intentional life. I, don't, I think what was very valuable about our generation, at least at one point, at least in the late 60s, early 70s, was that idea what, that to find work that was your passion, to set out and into life that wasn't merely this grid of success. There was some idea, maybe not any longer, of doing something I that you loved or maybe that even contributed to something or another. And what scares me with all of this uh, from uh, Sylvie Ann's book is you're basically telling young women, here are the years, here are your chances, this is what you've got to do. And so it negates romance, chance, idealism, all of those things that actually are very good about the boomer generation. Yeah, life's not a ch checklist. You know, no, that, that, it's that, you not. Know, you, you get some sort of like, find if you don't have everything accomplished at the end, you know, I, mean, I don't think we'll find and out. Obviously people don't forget to have children. So, you know, I think the other thing about this whole controversy is the idea that you are not successful as a woman and you're not living a whole life if you don't have children. It's interesting because men, really are pernicious. Not, men are not considered unsuccessful if they don't have children. In fact, <laughs> sometimes we quite successfully didn't have children. Exactly. <laughs> but it's not a punitive thing. I mean, I think Less people, broke, anyway. <laughs> I, I don't think people feel punitive toward men who don't have children. Mm -hmm. And they don't think it's odd that they don't have children. Mm -hmm. This is just not a problem with Irish Catholic girls who get pregnant <laughs> if you look at them wrong. You know? I mean, it's, they, 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 they always have kids. You know? it's, it's just, I don't know, you know, they, whether they mean to or not. Well, I wonder, going um, back to Sylvia Ann's book, is she seems to think um, that we women are paying a price for women's liberation and that this is, we're almost being punished for, for all of the strides we made forward. Th these are the punishments we're getting as, as we move forward. And I, Well, I mean, in fact, I interview a lot of young women to come work at the magazine, and many of them say to me in the process of the interview, well, I want to work, they're in their early 20s, I want to work a while, but then I want to get married and I want to have children, and I don't want to make the same mistakes you made, speaking of our generation. I don't want to wait too long. And that's sad because, as you say, it's not a checklist. Um, and you think that's the legacy we've left them? I don't think it is the legacy. I think that's what we're paying attention to right now. But in f I choose to be optimistic about this and think the legacy we left them is that you can have work about which you're passionate and to which you're devoted, and you can also have children if you want. Yeah, I think the legacy is they come to look for a job and Dominique's the editor. They're not coming into a room and you're not saying how fast do you type and that's all you're going to be capable in life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a huge difference, Betsy. 
And I think actually one of the good things about our generation is the legacy of the women's movement yeah. because it's changed possibilities for women and what they can do enormously. I mean, in the past two decades, uh, actually four women won the Pulitzer Prize for drama. Suzanne Lord Parks just won it last week. I mean, that's, that's a huge difference. It didn't occur before, and I think that's a very good thing. And I think all of this is saying about overputting all children in this and that, it's yet another way to make women feel badly about themselves, which isn't useful. And I know that when we graduated from college, we basically said, well, we don't want to do what our mothers did. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that will just always happen. You look at your mother and say, I don't want to do what you did, except for my daughter, who will say, you were wonderful. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I love your place. <laughs> Let's move on to um, a I want to get back to old for a minute, though. Old. I just want to say something in favor of being old. I mean, it's just, I just, you know, I, I just think it's so much better being old. I don't like the physical part of it. I don't think anybody likes the physical part of it. But, you know, people listen to you when you talk. People don't mess with you, because especially if you're kind of a, a you know, kind of, out of shape Irish guy who's 5'9", you know, obviously he's a cop, you know, don't <laughs> leave him alone, you know. It's, and, and, and people our age have got all the money, you know. I mean, we, we've got all the money, you know. The, 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 the child billionaires from the dot-com, they're back sleeping on the couch. They're broke, you know. <laughs> we got power of attorney over our aging parents, you know. We got their stuff, you know. It's, <laughs> it's cool, you know. <laughs> no, I, I mean, Actually, the money, thing, the money thing, the money thing, from what we found out is it's not, we didn't do quite as well as we could have with the money thing. It seems that many of us thought we were saving money for retirement, and now that we're looking ahead or thinking, can we retire, we, we don't have the money to do it. So. I talked to my uh, financial guy the other day, and he said, if the market stays good, you got the kids that are two and four, if the market stays good, you can retire when you're 80. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> but we, it's somehow, I think that came with the whole 60s thing, oh, money, you know, doesn't mean anything, and we... We, <laughs> we were so wrong about that. <laughs> we were really wrong <laughs> we about We dropped that, that quickly. When we were wrong, we were really wrong back then. You know? we, we were right about some stuff, but when we were wrong, we were really wrong. Um, I wanted to just move on and talk about the media, because uh, one thing that has really changed with our generation is the media, and I, PJ, I was going to address this to you, if you had any thoughts about how the media has changed. It's gotten stupider. I mean, really, I'm, so I'm, glad, stupider? I'm glad we've got you here tonight yeah. instead of who we were supposed to have because um, <laughs> <laughs> I won't say anything, you know, about, but I mean, it's just gotten stupider and it's not like the media had that far to go, you know, it wasn't like it was ever incredibly smart, but I mean, it's just everything is so celebrity oriented and it's to the point, but I don't know who these people are. I, I love what you said There's, in your book, Them. Them, yes. It, I, I wanted to, when Terry McDonald was running Us Magazine, I said, Terry, change it to Them. Right. Them Magazine. That's so wonderful. I mean, you'll sell. That's, it'll, it'll, do, it'll do good, you know. Uh, I can't, you know, I don't know who any of these celebrities are. In fact, Chris Buckley and I did a piece for Forbes FYI called Who the F Are They? You know, if there's a, you know, where we went through, we started with Leonardo DiCaprio because he fi we figured that, yeah, you actually, our readers do know who that is, but just barely. You know, he's the one they, they weren't looking at when all the clothes got wet in Titanic. And then we went down to, you know, down to, to things like Moby, you know, uh, and, and to explain this to 50 year old businessmen, you know, this. There's this, you know, he makes music that sounds like, uh, you know, you, that, that you left the microwave on and the car door <laughs> open. And, and, and so. Um, so that's bad. The brevity stuff is bad. Everything is all chopped up into, mm -hmm. into itsy bitsy captions, basically. It's caption journalism. Everything is a caption. And uh, uh, that is maddening. There was some study done about how to reach Generation Y. It turns out that they can type 120 words a minute on their laptops, but they can't read. <laughs> and this is going to be interesting, uh, uh, communicating with them. No, it's not, I don't think, uh, 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 I'd love to have somebody talk me out of this, but uh, I don't well, think Well, first of all, you, um, people are getting what they want. I mean, there's a reason that magazine covers have celebrities, because that's what people buy. And if you look at, <clears throat> excuse me, the best-selling magazines in America, and Dominique, jump in here, but People Magazine in style, and it's all about people and their things and their houses and their boyfriends and... It's, it's people are getting what they're asking for, and then I guess same with the television. We want it. 
don't not we they <laughs> them they, them wants it <laughs> yeah well that is one of the uh, uh, frightening sides I mean I'm a, I'm a, I'm a libertarian right winger I'm a Republican and I'm a, I, I, I'm a, I'm a, yeah I'd like uh, to take your position all this actually. kind of like stuff you know them. I mean I, I'm in favor of all this I'm a capitalist you know all this stuff but but I'd be lying if I said it didn't have a hideous downside the sort of empowerment of white trash you know that, that goes on and increasing prosperity in our society lets us find out what the proletariat really wants and what it wants is Us magazine, you know, mm -hmm, and like, mm -hmm. ooh, you know, Except that, don't <laughs> back you think in the box with the proletariat, you know. The I thing mean, that also really amazes me about magazines today is the sex component. You know, cover lines that now you just, we wouldn't have dreamed of being able to put well, on we would have dreamed of them, we just wouldn't have done them. We, we wouldn't have even thought of them. I, I mean, and that's, it's kind of amazing how much they want that and how much we produce it for them. Except that um, when 9-11 happened, I think the, everybody kind of did, everybody was, seemed to be very hungry for news and I, and I actually think the news, the media did a very good job of sort of stopping all that and going for the news. I mean, didn't, don't you think things changed during that time? No. I mean, I think, I think certain newspapers and certain magazines that always had integrity of what they were covering continued to have that kind of integrity. Um, you know, I, on the other side of what's happening with magazines, just to take the positive side of it, it's, there's a lot of candy out there. There's a lot of junk food. There's a lot of just fast hits. You can ignore it if you want to. And most of us do if we're the kind of people who want to sit down with a New Yorker, you know, for a couple of hours. So I, I could just make the case that there's entertainment for everybody and it's it's easy enough to just ignore, um, except that I think it is pulling down the general dialogue about what is appropriate and what we should be covering and what is worth spending money on. Let's move on to boomer politicians, because I see our time is coming close here. Do you think that boomer politicians like George Bush and Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton have changed sort of the political landscape? I. I I don't think, I wish they had. In some ways they have because of this whole idea I think of thinning in a sense, or maybe that whole idea and that goes into the media as well. Because it's almost as if that whole idea of short bites and that the public can only take things in short elements, which is now true in television, becomes true in politics too. It's as if one is saying, oh, you can't really comprehend if I'm going to say something at length. You begin to lose authenticity. And you, especially, I think, you know, it, because I write plays, you realize that there's a difference between when someone's really saying something they believe in or when someone is saying something they think you want, they want you to say. And I think that's what these politicians have accomplished. And that's not very good in terms of leadership because if you go and look at those speeches, go back 100 years and look at some speeches, even look at the, you know, the Lincoln debates or something, just in terms of language, just in terms of dialogue, there is an erosion there. And there's an erosion, there's the one, there's the bite-size passion. There's the bite-size idea. And I don't know that those are ideas that will carry you through. You remember when Ike was supposed to be stupid? You know, if you read what yeah. Ike says now, it sounds like Schopenhauer. You know? Yes, I mean, exactly. Uh, it's, it's to me like Clinton. I mean, quite quite aside from agreeing or disagreeing with the guy. I mean, to me, he was clown Kennedy. You know, I mean, look at the family, look at the hair, you know, the waistline. You know, I mean, he wanted so badly to be Kennedy, but he was just clown Kennedy. It just didn't work. You know, uh, Kennedy had Jackie. You know, he had Hillary. You know, I mean, it, was, it just you know the the whole thing was. Uh, a disaster, and every time the presidential limo would pull up in front of the White House, I expected like hundreds of Clintons to get out with great big shoes on, <laughs> and red nose. Um. But you know, in her, in what you're saying, both of you really, is a real cynicism. It's really talking for the sound bite and saying what is a sort of people-pleasing thing to say. And these people are rooted in, in our idealism, and Clinton was rooted in, in the 60s idealism, and we all had high Oh, come hopes. now. I mean, idealist and Clinton, and that's not, those aren't words When Clinton was running for president, didn't, didn't everybody bring to his, didn't everyone bring all of their sort of hopes for, you know, what was going to happen? What not at my golf club, no. Yeah, and in my golf club, they did, and we did. 
you know, and I remember people calling me in the morning and saying, I'm so happy, you know, for the first time in a long time, I can think this is, you know, one of us is, is president. So then... So what happened? I think I we mean, did about Hillary, too. Yes, and mm -hmm. what happened? What eroded all of this? I mean, even... PJ, even if you don't buy that he was he was one of us or some somebody, but something got eroded here. What what was See, that? I don't believe in sixties idealism. I've got to tell you the truth. I do not think that we were an idealistic generation. I think we were an opinionated generation. And, and idealism and opinion are two different things. I think that we liked to feel that we were on the right side. Uh, 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 and we liked to be morally smug, but we had a very shallow idea of what the issues involved were. It's important to remember in the really, the, the really vital moral work that was done in American society was not done by the boomer generation. It was done by the generation or half a generation before. Uh, Martin Luther King was not a baby boomer. The, the, the original feminists were not baby boomers. Uh, the, the people, uh, uh, even if it wasn't totally successful, the people who designed and, and, and built the welfare state, starting with Roosevelt, most certainly were not boomers. We weren't even born yet. The really important things were done by older people. Those were the real idealists. And uh, what, what, what we were was uh, a generation of spoiled brats uh, mm -hmm. who, who liked to think well of ourselves and make a lot of noise. Uh, and that's very different from, from being idealistic. I think that's a little harsh. I think that, um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Thank we were you. all spoiled brats. I think there were a lot of people who were out there really doing things and really, for better or worse, believed that they could change social, believed in social change and were working very hard to do it. I mean, I think the spoiled brats were the ones who kind of had the money not to work or, or to spend their whole days doing other things, taking drugs or something. But there were a lot of people on the front lines. Labor organizers versus the weather underground, you know? I mean, we, my generation thought we could end the war in Vietnam late by dressing like circus clowns, you know, and smoking a lot of dope and sleeping around. And the war lasted about what? About 15 years, you know? I mean, it so you, didn't work, you know? Are you saying this generation then had no social impact, that it was all done by the people? It had a huge social them? impact because of its demographic size and because of its enormous wealth. This is the first time in history that a huge group of people came of age with enormous financial resources. Financial resources provided by our parents, incidentally, not, not, not by ourselves. And uh, this had an enormous impact. All of a sudden, the entire nation was, in a sense, sort of upper middle class in its opportunities. Tom Wolfe is really the best social critic of this. I mean, he said that what the 60s really were about was suddenly the whole of America, a whole, a whole generation in America was freed to be spoiled rich kids. It said that there was a belief that through movements you could change society. There was an idealism through, say, whether it was initiated by us or not, but the feminist movement, certainly the gay movement, during the time that the boomers came of age, even civil rights, although it wasn't certainly initiated by that, and that has changed during our lifetimes. There is an inclusion in this country that has, certainly it's not, it ain't over, but it's grown, it's certainly grown. Not to mention Watergate. I mean, I think that, that our generation reacted in a huge way to Watergate and, and changed politics in some way because Yeah, but it wasn't us that did that. We didn't do Watergate, but we no, certainly reacted. No, neither the bad side nor the good side, really. You know, it was, uh, it was people a little older. I, you know, I suppose, I, I mean, I like to think that my generation is not without its merits. It's a tolerant generation. But then again, my generation has been against quality control of all kinds, you know, whether it was... Uh, uh, quality control of bigotry, uh, uh, or whether it was the quality control of being actually able to play your musical instrument uh, uh, or, uh, or rhyme your poem. Um, we don't like any of that stuff. So I'm not sure that our tolerance speaks all that well of us, although it's, it is in of itself a good thing. Maybe you were on the front line a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. <laughs> one, one, one bong toke. <laughs> do you think that um, that this and do you think that we have gone more conservative? We've become more conservative than we were, say, 20, 30 years ago. Or is this? I mean, were you, you haven't have you always been politically where you are now, or did this come with? Time? I was a communist. 
Well, then you've... I, was, I came home from college and I had my hair back down to my butt and a jean jacket with a big red fist on my back. I come from a really rock rib Republican downstate Illinois family. And my grandmother was, she said, Pat, I'm worried you're becoming a Democrat. <laughs> I like blew up. I said, Grandma, Lyndon Johnson is a Democrat. You know, and he's killing all these innocent Viet Cong. He's starting riots in our inner city. He's a fascist pig. Of course I'm not a Democrat. I am a communist. And my grandmother said, just as long as you're not a Democrat. <laughs> and I never have been. I went from Republican to communist to Republican. You know, I, I, no, I was never a Democrat. And we, we, would you say this, this evolution was um, caused inwardly or outwardly from what you're reacting to? Commonsensically was what, you know, I mean, I, got, I, I, was, a, I was a raving socialist until I got a job. And I got a job and I got a paycheck. And uh, I was waiting avidly for this. You know, I was really eager to get this paycheck. I was being paid $200 a week. I was going to get 400 bucks. We got paid every two weeks. I got the paycheck. It was, uh, it, it netted out at 198 And I said, wait a minute, I've been advocating socialism all these years, screaming, yelling for socialism. What's this? We have socialism already. They just took half my paycheck. I'm a Rockefeller here. I'm making $200 a week. And uh, uh, so, you know, it just snapped. But on the, on the larger question of are we more conservative, I mean, quite aside from one's personal opinions, that a person who didn't become more conservative in a small c sense of the word over the course of 20 years of living would be a raving lunatic. You know, I mean, everybody becomes more, uh, so they have more experience to, 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 to ground them in. Uh, and, and more habits to, to, to stick in. All normal people become more conservative over 20 years. Well, either I'm, more conservative or quieter. Or quieter, yeah. I don't mean politically <laughs> conservative. I mean just more, you know, I mean you just become yeah, more certain I, of your... I, I could see becoming more of a crackpot, actually. <laughs> <laughs> They're I not think, mutually inconsistent. No, <laughs> I mean, it's not mutually exclusive, crackpot But I think as you get older and wiser and you start thinking, well, life is random anyway, so in some ways, that's very liberating mm -hmm. because it makes you slightly less conservative with a small c. Mm -hmm. Because what is there to be fearful of? You've seen it. So you might as well, <laughs> whatever. I, I mean, I can see it as in some ways somewhat freeing. Well, I find just from, from our readers that, that uh, there are two things, that people are, th as you say, Wendy, people are thinking, well, if I, if I don't do whatever it is now, when am I going to do it? So they really take the leap of faith now. And also people really are in a, a point where they're wanting to give back and they're really sort of taking these, you know, going out on a limb and really working to do something that they have sort of always believed in or thought of but never really taken the time to do. So I kind of disagree with the fact that they're getting, I mean, maybe we're using the words differently, but I do think people are, are taking the chances and taking the time to do what they always wanted yeah, to do. Well, conservative social, you know, small c is kind of um, about not accepting, not wanting change too much. And certainly among a lot of women I know, we're much less conservative, actually, than we used to be so in terms of what we're doing with our lives, our jobs, a willingness to completely throw a career up in the air, try something else, stay home for a while, come back to work. And I think there's, there's a lot of change, and a lot of it's actually pretty radical. Um, and I, you know, I think the conservatism that I see really does have to do with getting tired, you know, feeling quiet, mm -hmm. not feeling like you want to blow up more brain cells because <laughs> you're counting them as they evaporate, <laughs> things like that. Um, but, you know, social conservatism, I, I think we've actually, we're still making a lot of change um, in, in people's expectations about what their futures are going to be like. I think uh, the, the way people become more conservative as they get older is, uh, again, I, I come back to common sense, um, that uh, abusing your body with drugs and alcohol seems like less of a good idea and it doesn't seem like a good idea to advise other people to do it or let your children do it. Uh, I think people be, tend to become more religious as they get older uh, mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for very good reason. Um, I think that they become less appreciative of disruptive behavior mm -hmm. uh, and, and therefore uh, uh, more alert to etiquette because etiquette is nothing but a sort of shared system of, uh, 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 you know, sort, sort of a shared pattern of behavior pattern that makes behavior. everything easier for everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that way, I think people become uh, more conservative, which I think is a good thing. Right. And I, the other thing that I think happens as you get older, you appreciate small things much more. So we're maybe more conservative in what we want to keep doing or what we want to hang on to. And they can be very small. 
two of you, Wendy and Dominique, are both raising children on your own, um, and I wondered if we could speak to that for a minute. Um, does Actually, it, my no. wife is, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but she's not here. Is that something you ever conceived that you could be able to do? Is that, is that? No, I don't think it was, you know, the 1950s dream. I don't think, you know, my mother never said to me, Wendy, darling, I hope you become the single mother. Uh, you know, <laughs> grow up to live alone on Central Park West. Please, please, I dream about it. Um, that, that, that wasn't the case, really. But I think that, you know, I, I, it wasn't you know, watching the Danny Tomlin show or all of that Father Knows Best or any of those shows, that wasn't, you know, the nuclear family. And then as we grew up, we found out that everyone who was on Father Knows Best was like, you know, living in some dysfunctional family and they were all alcoholic and God knows what else. So, um, I don't know. I, I think that it just, you know, life, you make certain decisions and it plays out that way. Do I sit there and think, oh God, oh God, how can I raise this child alone? You know, I wish I were married so that on an application I could say, well, here's my husband's name. It just didn't come out that way. You know, I, it just, people, I think what's good about our generation is truly not only just the tolerance, but the choice that you can live many different kinds of lives. And the life I'm living right now is of a single mother, and it's fine. It's actually very rewarding. Um, are there times that are lonely and, you know, whatever? Yes. Are there times when I think I'm thrilled that I don't have to make this decision with somebody else? Yes. You know, there are certain times when, you know, if Lucy is saying, no, 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 I'm very glad there isn't someone else there to say, this is all your fault. Uh, <laughs> it's my fault. I accept it. You know, <laughs> that's okay. But, you know, in other times, I think I wish there was someone here. It just is, you know. But I think that what's good about it is I don't feel a stigma about it. Uh, so far, my daughter doesn't feel a stigma about it. Um, we have many friends who live many different lives, and it all seems to be valid and good, you know? Um, well, I don't, I don't actually feel that I am raising my children alone. I have joint custody of the children with their father, and they are with me half the week and with him half the week. So, and he's very present and very involved in their lives. So he's raising them in his house, and I'm raising them alone for half the week. So, is it, and, and most divorced couples who have children are in this situation. And I, I have often thought that what I really have is disjointed custody. It's, it's really an odd thing to be setting policy at your house or answering moral questions or doing these things not knowing whether or not you're disagreeing with what was said five blocks away about the same issue and, and not having somebody there to consult. Um, to ha what, what do you think? What, how should we approach this? You know, do you think I should have told them my sister did drugs or something like that? Um, so I, I think that um, I, I definitely don't feel alone entirely, and I think most people who have joint custody one way or the other don't feel entirely alone, but it is an odd, um, there's an odd loneliness to doing it at times. And then there's also huge relief, as Wendy says, of not having to second guess, not having to consult, not having to do all those things. So parenting is always problematic no matter what. Um, I think no matter what your circumstance, it's always tricky. Well, what, I was, another question which you're sort of coming close to answering, when we, um, again, when we were doing focus groups and stuff from my generation, we were interviewing people are in this age group, we would ask them, how old do you feel? And every single one of them said, oh, I'm 35, I feel 35, and we're not. But um, I wonder how you think, all of you, that we're going to go onward in aging and how we'll do it. Will we do it gracefully? Will we go kicking and screaming? I, I just wonder how you see it. Yeah, is gray yeah. hair really an existential issue? <laughs> um, I, I feel, I have this odd uh, feeling now because my oldest son is 17 and is about to go to college and I have 
distinct and vivid memories of being 17. I, can, I feel like I can enter into his life. I know his friends. I can see the kind of kid I would have been hanging out with. And um, it's a really, uh, there's an odd way in which I want to struggle against going forward and sort of go back into his life because it feels so vivid to me and the future is so unknown. It's very poignant, um, getting old <laughs> and nice. <laughs> I like it. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm making plans to get as cranky and cantankerous. <laughs> I'm like practicing being deaf. My father-in-law is real. <laughs> my father-in-law's got it nailed. You know, I mean, it's and it, and it, it's it, and the secret is selective hearing. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I, 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 I kind of like all that stuff. I, uh, I would not be uh, a kid again for anything. I was just looking at kids. I was, I was covering the, uh, the uh, demonstrations in the eight million different demonstrations against everything you can possibly imagine and some stuff you can't that were held in Washington over the weekend. And um, I was looking at the kids involved in these, and I thought, you know, it was tough enough being a kid when I was a kid, but now you have to pierce things. Mm -hmm. Ouch, you know? And, like, what if you're scared to, but you feel like you have to anyway, you know? And, and tattoos. And, and tattoos. How are you gonna, I mean, how's that going to look when you're 90, you know? I mean, <laughs> mommy has a, uh, you know, I just saw mommy in the bathroom, and she has a, you know, a flaming devil head on her behind. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, what? what how are people, well, never mind, you know, uh, not my problem, is it, you know? But I feel like my children are much more conservative than I am, and I feel like a lot of their friends are, too. It's really odd. They're more careful. They're more nervous about things. They have much bigger anxieties. They grew up getting sex education at school that, in, that is all about AIDS. Fear intensive, it's fear. isn't it? Yes. And, you know, what's, yesterday at the dinner table, my kids told me that they've just launched a program in the public high schools for terrorist, anti-terrorist training, and bomb, uh, not bomb scares, that's what we had when we were kids, uh, gun, gun attacks. So they're taught now when there's an alert, pull down the blinds, huddle in a corner, close the doors. And I thought, Zowie, you know. Uh, you know the great thing about, about sex education during art when we were in school was, yeah. it was obviously taught by people who had never had any. <laughs> <laughs> You were like off they. the hook. You were off the hook. You didn't have to believe anything they said. You know? And we didn't. And we, yeah, and we didn't, you know. But now, you know, now it's taught by, like, hepsters, you know. And, exactly. and I'll tell you about my ninth case of gonorrhea, kids. You know? <laughs> And uh, uh, no, yeah, and and the things that we were taught, you know, the duck and cover from an atomic bomb, like right. even at six or seven, you knew, forget it, atomic <laughs> bomb, boom, you know, you're gone, you know, it was it just didn't, it didn't really resonate, you know, but not, but person coming into school with a gun, that you know, it's on the news every night, you know, mm -hmm. you really would worry about that, mm -hmm. poor kids. So do you think we're raising a generation that's in in ways much more conservative than we were when that we were that age? Your kids I age? definitely think so. I definitely think so. I don't. I mean, yes, drug drug use is happening, but I, I I think it's. I think there's a big change in what how we're raising our kids. Partly because we're passing on our feels fears. Partly because it is a scarier world. The stakes are much higher. All right. I'm gonna. Um, you guys have asked some questions from the audience, so I'm gonna just throw these out to the panelists. Um, do you think this generation will be more oh, conservative than our own? Well, I guess we answered that. Do you plan to ever retire? If so, what would you want to do? Much like TJ, I think I can retire at 80, maybe. Uh, so I don't actually think I, I have a choice in this matter. Um, Although a, a friend of mine, the late uh, lyricist composer Ed Cleban, who wrote a chorus line, once told me never to retire, because uh, he had retired at like 44 after he wrote a chorus line. So, um, so I, I do listen to that quite a bit. Why did, what, why did, what did he mean by that? I think he meant, you know, as a writer, it's a good idea to keep working in some ways or keep, keep that alive. I don't know. I, I can't sit still very much, so I wouldn't be very, I, I don't know. I don't think I'd be very good at retirement, so I might as well keep working. But I think because of my daughter, I'm, I'm working till I'm 80 anyway, so I have no choice. Yeah, I think I'm going to be working a long time too, but the idea of play is really appealing. <laughs> 
playing golf, or I don't play golf, but I mean, just the idea of being, having time, not working quite so hard, having time to amuse myself, do other things like that. That I would be great. But so maybe I want to, what? I want to drink in the daytime. Have you ever tried it? <laughs> it's oh, yeah. amazing. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> right, and yeah. they're, they're really a good sign of aging. Yeah. Let's see, five yeah. o'clock, yeah. three yeah. o'clock, right. noon. Yeah. <laughs> Sun's over the yard, Arm. <laughs> So we've covered that. Okay. Um, <laughs> in terms of legacy, what about the legacy left to today's fathers, so many who are choosing to stay home and raise the kids while the wife is on the fast track? Do you agree with this role reversal? Well, it's great if you can get the wife to do it. <laughs> I often urge my wife to go back to work. Uh, she was a, a PR, kind of a high-powered PR executive, you know, and... Uh, uh, then, of course, we think about that for a moment and realize exactly how competent I would be at child raising. And um, uh, yes, no, you know, I mean, it would just, uh, beer is not a vegetable. Actually, <laughs> 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 well, I mean, yes, for grown ups. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, I mean, you know, do you have to change diapers once a day or is it every other day? <laughs> So uh, we're just, uh, we just don't feel we have that option at, uh, at my house. Although I think it's great, you know, if guys can convince their wives to do it. I don't have that option at my house. <laughs> well, I certainly don't have that option. <laughs> um, well, but what was the question? Life just has a way thing? of making this decision for you. But how I you think feel the... about the role reversal? How you feel about the, the man being able, taking care of the kid. I, I think it's sort of irrelevant how anybody else feels except the wife. And I actually know a few situations in which the woman is working and the man has basically stayed home and knows how to change the diapers once a week. And <laughs> it's, it's fine for them, although there are, I do have women friends who feel resentful, actually, that they have to work as hard as they have to work in order to maintain the house or in order to maintain a standard of living. I think it's a tricky, tricky thing, but um, it's not a political issue. You know, it sort of isn't anybody's business. Some people are much better with kids yeah. uh, than, yeah. than, than others, and, uh, uh, and some of those people are men. Mm -hmm. They're much better. I mean, I know, I know couples where the where the you know mom is a horror show, you know, and dad right. is a nurturing and caring sort of uh, mm -hmm. uh, pulled together uh, character. Uh, you know, I just don't. I, I don't think it's it's one of those things. We, as a generation, we have a tendency to you know the all politics is personal. Uh, I mean, Tip O'Neill was right, all politics is local, but mm -hmm. is right. everything personal have to be political? I mean, no. you know, we have a, a way as a generation of butting into other people's business, you know, and we probably should butt out. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. Would you comment on Ms. Dowd's article in the New York Times regarding mm -hmm. women who graduated from the Ivy League colleges who were most undesirable as potential mates? This was Maureen Dowd's column about Sylvia Hewlett's book, I guess, talking about um, basically women. she's saying men don't like smart women. Smart women I, I think this whole thing is an outrage. Her outrage over that the idea again that you know some guys don't like smart women, well, some women don't like smart men. That's the world. See, That's quite a few women like. don't like smart men. Quite a few, <laughs> exactly. So anybody with sisters who've gotten married knows. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a plague out there of men who don't like smart women. Um, and I, I think it is an example of making the personal political. Um, you know, I, and also as somebody who's raising two boys, I think often about what am I going to teach these kids about women and what kind of an example am I setting for them and do they dislike smart women or anything like that. I don't see signs of that among kids. I don't see signs of that among their friends. Yes, there are some men who are put off by that, but then there are some men who are really into it. I don't think, you know, I honestly don't think I've ever, I, I do know some men who don't like smart women, that's because they're very stupid themselves, you know? <laughs> and they don't actually like smart people very well, you know? Uh, but yeah, I, don't, I don't know of any of my peers, you know, for, for whom I have any, my male peers that have, uh, uh, um, you, you, men, can be very stupid about women, but that's not because they like stupid women, you know I mean? They can be distracted by other features of women that, uh, you know, don't have much to do with brain power. Uh, but, you know, brain power is a neutral in that equation, you know? It's, uh, uh, they didn't deliberately marry this girl because she was 
38D and real dumb. You know, the real dumb part was an accident. You know, just kind of came with the rest of the bank. An added attraction. Right. I think this whole discussion is really about fear, actually, and that's the hidden fear message and underneath. Maureen Dowd being out of things to write about. Oh well. You know, uh, all writers <laughs> you know the, the feeling. <laughs> I also think smart is also a code word for aggressive, assertive, opinionated. It doesn't necessarily mean oh, smart. Oh, well, that's, a, I mean, you know, that's another matter. I mean, do you want somebody screaming at you all the time? I don't think anybody's too fond of that, you know, so, you know. Right. So if that's what she means, I mean, if these if were that's screamers, what aggressive is. You know. Okay. Um, are there any downsides to having children when you are older? Question mark. Upsides. Oh, goodness. Well, the downside is, yes, you get very, very tired. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly, I mean, I never thought I'd be running around the playground at this age. And I'm not that great at it. Uh, the upside is suddenly you're introduced into this whole world of two-year-olds so that I know things I never knew before. My daughter goes to a toddler center at Varnard College. And suddenly, you know, you start learning about child development and all these kids who are suddenly saying no and they crawl through tubes and then they tell me they're crawling through the birth canal. Who, who knew this? Uh, is this, is this child the, told is you this? Is this the anti-mame school? It is. is this the school that I'm Dennis becoming a to? crackpot. Um, <laughs> But I think it's wonderful. I mean, talk about another generation coming of age to be in touch with these two-year-olds. I mean, I don't even know what generation they are because we're out of the alphabet. I don't know. They're like generation to the nth. I don't know, you know, what their world is going to be like, but I love knowing them. I love thinking about, even when it's scary, what's their world going to be like? I find them really moving really interesting, really hopeful. Even the makeup of that class I find very hopeful. So I think that's a real upside of it. And in terms of aging, it, it changes things because I think, well, yes, I want to be part of the ongoing world because I want to share this with my daughter. I, I want to know. I mean, I'm not much interested in current rock and roll. I stopped at a certain point, and she can have babysitters to find out about that. I actually think in terms of the boomer generation, what we did contribute, or at least our time did, was like the best rock and roll, frankly. Yeah. And I, I don't think it's gotten better since then. That's oh. ours. <laughs> Um, no, my kids are discovering Cream, Led Zeppelin. That's it. Right. You know, you go to a bar <laughs> mitzvah. You, you sort of shove a little of it that way. Or, or yeah, you... and they all think, oh, this is great. And it's because, yeah. well, then you kind of think, oh, yeah, yeah. it is great. It is great. You yeah. know, that stuff was great. Yeah, that's really true, because imagine, I mean, kids do like that. Yeah, uh, and imagine if we, uh, when we were, say, 16, I mean, imagine us listening to what our parents listened to, Prez Parada. <laughs> 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 I don't think so, you know. But any, the, the thing about... Um, having kids when you're older is they don't wreck your life. You know, if you have kids when you're 20, they wreck your life. You got all this, like, stuff going on, you know. You want to, uh, you know, you want to, uh, who knows what, I don't even remember what it is you want to do, but I know, I remember you, you want to do a lot of things. And uh, having kids when you're 50, it doesn't wreck your life because you already wrecked your life, you know I mean? It's, it's gone. <laughs> You can afford it. Yes, that's you know, true. You know, I mean, at least, you know, uh, uh, you know not, not everybody is that lucky. But generally speaking, people at 50 have more money than they do at 20. And so it's a little easier to afford the depredation. But the tired thing, especially, I mean, for somebody who makes their living as a writer or just takes a least moderate amount of mental alertness, unless you're writing about the smart girls that nobody wants to marry. <laughs> maybe, maybe she had a long night, you know, maybe there was, you know, one of those nights where the kid was up, you know, every 15 minutes, you know. Yeah, but let me say, the tired thing happens in your 20s, too. I nearly dropped out of exhaustion from Did having you? children yeah. in my, See, in I my imagine 20s. I have much it, more energy I now. I imagine that it wouldn't, uh, no, but I was, no. that's no. not true. No, it, it, no it's exhausting. Yeah. Okay, here's a great question. What current sitcom do you think most accurately reflects American life? Oh, God. I don't watch television. I do not watch television at all. But if you did. If I did, <laughs> how would I know? <laughs> Just make one up. C-SPAN. I sometimes watch C-SPAN. <laughs> Needs a laugh track. <laughs> it would be much better with a laugh track. Probably reflects at least part of American life. No, I recruise myself from that question. I, I watch uh, Boston Public High with the kids um, every once in a while, and I find it amazing. I'm watching this show with them, thinking, 
this is a joke. They cannot possibly be relating to this. And every episode, we have a really interesting conversation about exactly what they are relating to. They feel it totally reflects their lives. And I, I think that's kind of amazing, because uh, every horrible thing that could happen happens on that <laughs> show, four of them every week. Wow. <laughs> so. You know, I sort of watch uh, <laughs> old reruns of I Love Lucy at 2 o'clock in the morning, so I'm really not the person to ask. That's great. That's yeah. what it's like. Yeah, I like a turn of movie classics. I'm in sort of, <laughs> I'm you need not a the nursing to mom ask. for this. You know, yes. when, my, when my wife was nursing, like yeah, there, was, there was like a period there of like several months where she knew about everything on television at every hour. Yeah. <laughs> because, I, you know, I didn't know until we had kids. I thought nursing was like, you know, sort of like, you know, film up, you know, it's like stopping at the Exxon station, you know. I didn't know it took hours. <laughs> Let's go on and on and on and on. So she was quite an expert on television there for a little while, but then it did. So I do watch Clifford the Big Red Dog and wonder who cleans up after him. <laughs> so, in fact, I've asked my four-year-old, I said, who cleans up after Clifford? You know, he does go potty. And <laughs> she looks at me like I'm large and stupid. <laughs> Just a story, Daddy. So nobody thinks sex in the city is the answer? I've never seen it. Okay. I've never seen it. Okay, what is the solution to the second shift phenomenon when married women handling the majority of housework and children even though they work? Paid help. I mean, that's, I mean you know, cleaning ladies and stuff. Right? <laughs> yeah. And if you can't afford that? Shoot yourself. <laughs> What's the right answer to that question? Wait, the question is, there's a man and a woman, a husband and a wife at home. And he's and not he's helping. Not, and he's not helping. And the, yeah. and the charts. I mean, I'm sorry, the wife. No, charts. Out. I'm raising little men, and they respond really well to charts. This is your men, job. Check. Right? Yeah, men because, you know, to a lot of times part of the politics of being in a couple is that you don't really make it clear what you want so that you can shoot them. I see stares and denial of sex will work pretty well, too. Yeah, you know? all right. <laughs> <laughs> Not that, you know, you don't want to try that with the teenage kids, but it's, um, <laughs> the icy stares, maybe, you know. <laughs> so, um, okay. Know. Help. Um, <laughs> what do you dream of accomplishing that you haven't gotten around to yet? Well, I would like to conduct a symphony orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not into that. Gosh, I you know, I find it so hard to write that I keep thinking every time I set out to like write a play or something, I, I think, well, that's accomplishing something. Um, you know, I kind of think if I can just, oh, you know, uh, get up, exercise, <laughs> just get through the day. Uh, I always think that's, that's an accomplishment. I don't get further than that. So I'm torn here between drinking in the daytime, which, we're about, <laughs> which I do do every now and then, but I just don't get to that do That sounds often. No, good. Yeah, I think so. And getting on the green in three, you know, once more than, more than every, once every 18 holes or so. Um, I, you know, I mean, one of these days I'm going to learn how to write. And then it won't mm -hmm. be so hard. Right, right? that'd be good. And, uh, and I'm going to write something that I actually think is any good. Um, but, you know, I think maybe I'd rather drink during the daytime. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to wear spike heels. And, oh. <laughs> and I can't do that. I wasn't going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but at some point I would like to. Yes, to Condé Nast. We'll help you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, we've lived our lives differently from the generation before us so far. Will we be different in our old, old age, in our old age too? How? Well, first, I take a little bit of issue with that. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think it's, it's 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 easy to exaggerate the difference between ourselves and our parents, in the lives that they led and the lives that that, mm. that we led. I think many of our parents were more constrained uh, by economic circumstances. But my, both my parents led pretty exciting lives, and uh, I got born into the boring part, you know, but, but previous to that, they had done, I mean, my mom was in the Marine Corps. She was in the second unit of women's Marines, and she was a control tower operator. Uh, my dad was uh, in the Pacific, you know, and uh, had, had bummed around all during the 30s doing, doing various uh, jobs. He'd, he'd run, uh, uh, he was an older guy, he had run uh, 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 booze during Prohibition. 
uh, when, when he, was, uh, he was the same age during the 20s that I was during the 60s and behaving in much the same way, I think, as I was. And um, in fact, when I was, I was in the Philippines myself, I kept sort of looking around for a little O'Rourke-ish looking. <laughs> 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 well, I think they're there. <laughs> So I'm not sure, you know, we have to remember there's a big difference between our, our parents as we saw them, you know, uh, and also the stuff that our parents told us and the stuff that they didn't tell us, mm. you know. So I'm, I'm not sure that there's too much to be, I don't know. I mean, Betsy, you know my mother. Her name is Lola, and she's a dancer. Uh, my mother, I, I can't tell you how old she is. She's 21 plus, but very <laughs> plus. But she has lived most of this century. Uh, she still dances. She dances at the Broadway Dance Center. She does jazz. She walks down the street and chorus boys stop her and say, Lola, how you doing? I don't think there's any way I'm going to be dancing at her age. Or that, you know, chorus boys will say, Lola, how you doing? Or Wendy, how you doing? I you know, I think to say, uh, much like TJ, you know, oh, that was a certain way and ours will be different. I see her as this very, you know, unique individual that's uh, amazing in her older life, really. I think when we think we're terribly different from our parents, it's probably because we don't know enough about that parent's life. We haven't, either we haven't listened to them or uh, we haven't questioned them carefully enough. Um, the, 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 they led uh, much more exciting lives than they would ever let on to our, their children, just as we exactly. led much more exciting lives than we're ever going to let on to our children. <laughs> and on it goes down. You know. Well, this has been really interesting. Thank you very much for coming and thank you very much for thank coming. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.